Hey fellow foodies, Dr. Quave here. I'm your host of Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, this week on the show, we're going to dig into one of my favorite fruits that you may not have ever heard of. It grows here in the eastern side of the United States. And that happens to be the largest fruit that is native to the U.S., the largest edible fruit, I should, I should qualify. Um, and the best way to describe its flavor, I think, is this mix between a banana, a pineapple, mango. So it's very tropical in flavor. Um, and its scientific name is Asinina triloba in the Anonaceae family, um, better known locally as the pawpaw or the American pawpaw. And I have the perfect guest for the show today to talk about the pawpaw and teach us everything we could ever want to know about this amazing fruit. Her name is Sherry Crabtree. Sherry is a horticultural research and, ex and extension associate at Kentucky State University, and she specializes in fruits and nuts such as pawpaw, persimmon, and blackberry, as well as other unique niche fruits. Her areas of focus include breeding, variety trials, propagation, value-added product development, which we're going to get into for the pawpaw soon too, um, conducting orchard tours and workshops, and assisting fruit and nut growers from commercial orchards all the way to hobbyists. She has a master's degree in plant and soil science from the University of Kentucky and has been with Kentucky State University for 21 years. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Sherry. It's really great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Right. Well, you know, right now, as you well know, it's it, we're starting to get into pawpaw season in, in the eastern U.S. I live here in Georgia, and I moved into my house two years ago. And my at the top of my wish list when we, when we bought our, our home was, I have to plant some fruit trees. So, of course, I was like, I want to plant some native fruit trees. And I got two pawpaws and just this year for the first time, I have one beautiful fruit and I'm keeping okay. an eye on it to make sure the squirrels or whatever other recruiters <laughs> don't get it before I do. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit about the pawpaw? Like, what is this? Um, what is this fruit all about? Sure. Um, like you said, pawpaw is the largest edible tree fruit native to North America. So it's a really unique flavor. It's a blend of mango and banana. And one very unique thing about pawpaw, you mentioned it's in the Ananaceae family. The rest of that family are all tropical and subtropical fruits. Pawpaw is the only temperate member of that family, um, the only member of the family that can grow um, up here where it's cold, where we get freezing temperatures below freezing in the winter. So it's this tropical tasting, tropical appearing plant that we can grow here, you know, in the northern areas of the U.S. where it gets gets fairly cold in the winter time. That's great. So for the listeners out there, you may be familiar with some of these other edible um, members of the NNAC. I'm thinking in particular of the custard apple, um, the soursop, the sweet sop. Um, so these are, as you said, tropical. But what's cool about the pawpaw is you get this tropical flavor, but here in this temperate region. Exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah, basically a tropical fruit you can grow in your backyard here in the U.S. That's great. So what can you share with us about the history of this fruit um, in the Americas? Was this always a part of the diet um, or how long have we do we know that people have been eating this fruit? Well, the first written record of Papa was um, in the 1500s. Hernando de Soto, that was an early explorer of the Americas, reported that Native Americans in the Ohio River Valley and Mississippi River Valley were eating and using pawpaws. So we know that Native mm -hmm. Americans ate the fruit, they dried the fruit and made a cake out of it, they used the wood, and um, probably a lot of the spread of pawpaw around the eastern U.S., especially the more northern regions, was due to Native Americans um, planting pawpaws. Nice. And so this is a a relevant question. If, if this has been a part of the U.S. diet for so long, why, why don't we see it today in grocery stores? Well, one of the main reasons, pawpaw is a very short shelf life when it's ripe. So mm -hmm. especially today, so much of food production is based around being able to store it for a long time and ship it long distances. So much produce is, is produced in California or Mexico or other countries even and shipped all around the U.S. or all around the world even. Um, so pawpaw, when it's ripe, it has a shelf life of only a few days. 
Um, it bruises easily. So right now it's really more for the fresh fruit, at least more of a local market. You'll find it at farmer's markets and places like that. So the shelf life and perishability is the main impediment to a, a commercial industry. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that in recent years, there's been a movement towards trying to bring out products that allow for these like longer shelf life that are based on pawpaw. What, what can you share with us about, about those products and, you know, what's available out there in the market? Yeah, there's quite a few value added products you can make with pawpaw. And like you mentioned, that's a good way around the short shelf life. You may not have the fresh fruit year round or even be able to ship it around the country. But if you make a jam out of the fruit, if you make wine or beer out of the fruit, that's easily stored and shipped long distances. Um, Papa wine, Papa beer, brandy, those are some of the main products that we see. Papa beer especially is popular, but there's some distilleries here in Kentucky that make a Papa brandy. There's several wineries that do Papa wine. Um, so that's probably the most common Papa product we see on the market right now. Um, Papa ice cream, pretty much everybody loves ice cream, and it does make a really good ice cream because the fruit has a creamy texture, kind of like a ripe avocado texture. So it, mm. it lends itself really well to ice cream. Um, Papa jam, jellies, things like that are another product. And you can make baked goods. Basically, anything you make with banana, you can substitute Papa in equal parts to banana. So, um, you know, bread, muffins, things like that nice. are good for Papa also. And we see some hot sauces on the market. It's Even though Papa is sweet, kind of a sweet, spicy thing. So things like um, hot sauce and salsa. Um, can also be made with pawpaw. Well, that's amazing. We are huge hot sauce consumers in our household, so I may have to like play around with that one fruit if I can get it off of the tree before the squirrels do um, yeah, to add into our hot sauce uh, recipe at home. That's For great. Sure. Well, one thing I think that might be really cool is if you can tell us a bit about the the pawpaw tree itself. Like, what does it look like? How big is it? what's its growth cycle like um, and what types of, of environments does it really thrive in? Sure. So we mentioned pawpaw is native to the U.S. So in, in the wild, it's usually found in the understory of hardwood forests, usually along um, rivers and creeks, habitats like that. Um, it's a fairly small tree, the maximum size about 40 feet, but really that would be unusual. It's more often around 20 feet, 20 to 25 feet is maximum height you'll see. So in the wild, um, they spread by root suckers. So a tree will send up a lot of, of shoots from the roots around the tree. And in the wild, they will form um, these large patches. You may have heard the song way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. So they send up all these shoots and it looks like hundreds of trees, but it's really all from one root system. So it forms uh -huh. these large clonal um, patches in the wild in the woods, so that's kind of how it spreads naturally. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a relatively small tree. It's, um, even though in the wild, it often grows in the shade, it can grow in full sun and actually you get more fruit in full sun. So we recommend when people plant them for fruit production that you plant the trees in, in full sun or at least mostly sun to get better yields. That's great. So. With the with this root sucker system, does that also happen with a lot of the cultivars? I'm just wondering, have I planted a forest to be in my front yard with these two trees? Are they going to start sprouting up root suckers in the next few years? They will send up root suckers when you plant them, <clears throat> excuse me, in your yard or in orchards. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, maybe they'll, they'll give us more chance control. to control. It's not yeah. like bamboo that is invasive or sends up, you know, so many shoots that it's uncontrollable, but Generally, you want to cut down the root sucker so you don't get too many and overcrowd the tree and things like that. But but no, it's not not like an invasive plant, but they will send up a few root suckers around the tree, but you can easily mow them down or cut them down. Okay, cool. Well, for all the audience that's tuning in on YouTube, I want to just show a few pictures here. And for those of you that listen on the um, audio only, you can you can check out our videos on YouTube at the Teach Up Botany channel. But let's take a look at the um, at the tree. I think we have a nice photo of the full tree, um, and we can see here it has some really nice leaves. The leaves are really large as well. Do they? How how big do these leaves get? 
the leaves can be, um, I mean, up to about 10 inches long, but usually more like six to eight inches long, about eight inches long on average, um, up to 10 or 12 inches long. And that's another way, way that the tree looks kind of tropical. It has these large um, mm -hmm. kind of drooping leaves that have a tropical appearance. Um, has really nice flowers. You see in this photo has these maroon colored bell shaped flowers. And one unique thing about pawpaw is um, it's pollinated by flies and beetles rather than by bees. So mm -hmm. you can see um, how the flower would somewhat attract flies and beetles that had, you know, the dark red color is more attract attractive to those insects than, than to bees. Yeah, it's like a dark, almost like a meat looking color exactly. in a way. Yeah, kind of a, this meat attractant. Interesting. Right. And a lot of people are concerned about the fragrance of the flower. In fact, a lot of literature reports says that it has a fetid aroma. It really doesn't, to me, it doesn't have much smell at all. So you're not going to plant a tree in your yard and you know you have one in your yard that has flowered. They don't, you know, they don't have a bad smell to them. If you get your nose right and the flower, it has a little bit of kind of a musky aroma. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of, of um, immediately I'm thinking about the corpse flower that smells, you know, like that also uses insects that, that are attracted to this kind of meat or rotting meat smell. Um, but that one has a much more evident <laughs> right, it does odor. not smell like that. But the yeah, colors it does not smell like it. Right. The color is the same. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Right. Well, um, I know that you're you've been working at Kentucky State now for 21 years, heavily involved in these breeding programs um, around these different pawpaw cultivars. And I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about that program and? What goes into like what are you selecting for as you as you try out these different cultivars? Sure, um, a lot of people first off don't even realize that there are cultivars or named varieties of pawpaw. They're more familiar with the wild trees and think well pawpaw is a pawpaw, but there are um, cultivars named varieties of pawpaw. Just like there's honey crisp and gala apples, there are improved named varieties of pawpaw also. So we have a breeding program at KSU. Um, there's a few other pawpaw breeders, namely um, Neil Peterson, who's in West Virginia that has bred and released some pawpaws also um, that are improved fruit quality, improved yields. So the main things that we look for, I mean, flavor is still first and foremost. You <clears throat> want to have a good flavor, obviously. Um, be productive, have large fruit, high yields. Um, also, we're looking for disease resistance. Um, Papa is fairly insect and disease resistant already, being a native plant. But there, <clears throat> there is one fungal disease that um, causes a black spot on the leaves and the fruit that we see sometimes. So we're breeding for disease resistance, um, early ripening, a firmer fruit because that would, would store and ship better. A color break, um, you saw the photo of the fruit, they're green generally even when they're ripe. So we would like to see some that have more of a yellow color change to the skin when they ripen. So those are just a few things that we are, are breeding for. That's awesome. And we've released That's three pawpaw cultivars so far from KSU's breeding program. KSU Atwood, KSU Chappelle, and KSU Benson are the three that we have had developed and had in trials here and released so far for um, the public to buy. You can find them in nursery catalogs and garden centers. Oh, that's great. So so this is, I'm sure that many listeners might be interested in doing. So uh, the advice then is to find a nice sunny spot if you want to have high fruit yield. And um, when's the right time to plant? Like when should people start looking for these in catalogs? Spring is the best time to plant pawpaws. So we recommend planting them um, in spring, anytime um, March is a good time to plant if you're planting trees that are dormant. If you're planting potted trees, there's a little bit more leeway. You can plant them later in the spring after the chance of frost is over, so in, in mid-May or so. You do need two, at least two different trees to cross-pollinate because they're not self-fertile. Um, so you want to get at least two different varieties for cross-pollination. That's a, yeah, that's a really good point. And that's why I have two in my yard. Soon to be two pop-up patches, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> I, because of that need for cross-pollination. Even though, you know, they do, I think they can be found in forests throughout Atlanta. Um, but I wonder how, 
how important is the distance? Like how, how close in proximity do you need your trees to be in order to really facilitate that cross pollination? Well, recommended spacing is eight to 10 feet between trees. You don't wanna go any farther apart than 30 feet. So you could go farther apart than the eight to 10 feet if you wanted, you know, if you're playing them in your yard for landscaping and you want them in a certain mm -hmm. spot in your yard. Um, but any farther apart than 30 feet apart is, uh, is gets to be too far apart for good pollination. The flies and beetles don't fly quite as far um, as bees do, they're not not as energetic, so you want them to be be fairly close together for pollination. That's a really good point. Maybe that explains why I only got one fruit because I think mine are near that that distance of thirty feet. This is this is good advice. I may mean, have to put well, a third to, yeah. to meet in the middle. <laughs> put one in between. Um, well, I'll also say if this is the first year <clears throat> that they fruited, usually the first year that they produce fruit, they will not produce very many. So it's okay. they. First take, um, grafted trees take three or four years to produce fruit. Seedlings take seven to eight years to produce fruit. So they take a while to produce fruit anyway. Um, usually the first year they flower, they will not set fruit. Um, and then the first year they set fruit, it will usually not be very many. Okay, okay. Well, maybe I'm not, not too far apart then because we're still pretty early in the, in the grow process, yeah. <laughs> And don't be shocked. Um, sometimes the first year it sets fruit, they will fall off the tree because the tree is just too young. It's not old enough or large enough to um, to support fruit. So we do see a drop in June. Usually is when it happens. If the um, tree has too many fruit for the size of the tree, they'll drop them off, which is really a good thing. Um, it kind of thins itself. If you have um, peach trees or apple trees, you may know that you basically have to thin them or they'll set too many fruit. The limbs will break or the fruit will be too small or be poor quality. So pawpaw kind of does that naturally. They'll they'll drop fruit if they set too many or if they're too young to have fruit on them. That's really interesting. That's great that they can do that. Yeah. yeah. So um, when, as we talk about, you know, recipes and the ways to eat pawpaw, I, I love to eat it just fresh off the tree. Um, but you mentioned a number of, of different ways that it's processed into value added products. What are some of the favorite ways that you like to um, consume pawpaw or any recipes you like to share? Well, um, I think ice cream is the best. Of course, ice cream is good no matter what. But it's to me, um, applications where it's not cooked, I think it loses a little bit of the flavor and aroma when it's been cooked. So um, ice cream is my personal favorite, but it's good in things like yogurt, smoothies. Um, and our ice cream recipe that, that we developed here is pretty basic. It doesn't have eggs in it. You don't have to make a custard. So um, what we use, if people have their pen and paper ready, is um, between one and a half to two cups of pureed pawpaw fruit four cups of milk, four cups of cream, and three cups of sugar. And that makes about a gallon of ice cream. And you can cut it down if you have a small ice cream maker. Or add more pawpaw if you really want want a really, you know, good pawpaw flavor, strong pawpaw flavor in that. So, but that's that's my personal favorite recipe. Love the ice cream. And um, the jam is very good too. Um, but yeah, pretty much anything I've had with pawpaw has, has been good. It's been good, great. That's great. I love that. I love that idea of making ice cream. It's perfect for the summer weather and perfect timing for when the pawpaws are, are ripe and ready to harvest. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you mentioned earlier that one of the ways that it was recorded as being used historically by native peoples of the United States was also as a kind of a fruit leather. Is, is that still a practice or how do you know how to make such a fruit leather from pawpaw? It is not, and that's actually kind of an interesting thing um, because we don't recommend that you dry pawpaw fruit or make fruit leather out of it because I've actually had um, a fair amount, several people have emailed me and said that they dried pawpaw, ate it, and got sick to their stomach. And we don't know exactly why. Um, Dr. Pomper thinks that it may be, um, pawpaw actually has a fair amount of fats in it for a fruit, has monounsaturated fatty acids. So possibly the, the fats in it go rancid in the drying process and can make people sick. So um, I've heard it from enough people that we don't recommend that you, you dry pawpaw or make fruit leather with it. But apparently there's, you know, if Native Americans did this, there must be some method 
to do it that does not cause that issue. But it seems like dehydrators like people use today, um, just, we just don't recommend that you do that. So the best way to store pawpaw longer term is by freezing. Um, you can freeze the whole fruit, um, you know, skin and seed and all. Um, that takes up a lot of room in the freezer. The seed would then not be usable. Um, so really the best way to do it is to remove the skin and the seeds and puree the fruit, and then you can store it in freezer bags and then use that in your ice cream and baked goods and things like that. That's great. And I, I believe we have a photo too um, of what it looks like when you have the, the pawpaw bean, you know, um, cut up. And just for those that are listening, um, can you describe the the texture and the color of the flesh versus the seed and kind of what that looks like? Sure. Um, so the flesh, um, like you see in the picture for people that are watching the video, <clears throat> it has a yellow to orange colored flesh. So um, there are some that are light yellow, some even getting into the white range, but usually light yellow um, to yellow orange up to a dark orange for the darkest colored fruit. Uh, most of them that you see here are just kind of a yellow orange color. Um, the skin is green. Again, even when it's ripe, the skin stays green. Uh, the texture is creamy, kind of like a ripe avocado texture. And some that are softer, almost more custard-like or pudding-like in texture. So unfortunately, there's not um, a good mechanized way, like fully mechanized way of processing them since it's still a pretty small scale crop. Um, the machine that we saw here, the robot coop, it's a, kind of a commercial food mill almost, um, food, fruit puree machine. Um, you can use food mills, um, some of the you know smaller, not mechanized food mills that you use at home will work with pawpaw, but you do need to peel it. Or what we do is cut the fruit in half and scoop out the inside with a spoon and then put that in the food mill or whatever kind of device you're using. If you're only doing a few, you can use um, like a colander or a mesh bag. So cut the fruit in half, scoop out the insides and put it in the colander and push it through the spoon or put it in a mesh bag and squeeze it through or put it in your food mill. Um, the skin is bitter, so you wanna make sure not to get any skin in that. And even um, when you're scooping out the insides, you don't even want to scrape the skin too much because you can get some of those bitter flavors. And the seed is not edible. Um, you could see how large the seed are. They're about the size of a lima bean and they're hard, um, dark brown to black in color. So you're not going to accidentally eat a seed, but you don't want to get the seed in a blender or food processor if you're making the puree because the seeds do have alkaloid compounds in them that can make you sick. So um, definitely don't want to get accidentally getting seeds in your blender or food processor when you're making this, but they're easily removed. They're large, hard seeds. Yeah, that's a good point. So here you're using a food mill that can separate mm -hmm. that very soft kind of creamy flesh of the fruit that when you scoop it out, it scoops out easily like an avocado, like a ripe avocado does, right? So exactly. the challenge there is with the avocado, you've got one big seed and here you've got a number of, of little lima bean, like size hard seeds. So, yeah. Right. And so that food mill that you saw in the picture um, has paddles inside. So it kind of tumbles around um, with these paddles and it has a screen that the soft flesh gets pushed through and separated from the seeds. The home food mills um, also have a screen. They have a spiral that removes seeds and then has a screen that the flesh gets pushed through. And since it's soft and creamy, you know, it goes through the, the screen and gets separated from the seeds. So that's how, nice. how this works. Cool. So remember people, not a food processor, not a blender, and probably not a juicer either. You wanna use a food mill or push it through a strainer. <laughs> okay. Right. You can um, puree it after you get the seeds out. So it just, you, you just go. want to make sure that you remove the seeds. And if you're only doing a couple of fruit, some people just pop the seeds out. The seeds are kind of in a little sack. Um, and so sometimes you can just pop the seeds out with a knife. Um, nice. That's great. I, no, don't eat the skin. Don't eat the seeds. Don't eat the skin or seeds. But all the yummy mango, banana, pineapple deliciousness in between that, definitely exactly. eat. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so... How do you know when a pawpaw is ripe and ready to eat? This is always my struggle when I'm at the store, you know, is like, how do I know if a cantaloupe is ripe or a watermelon? But when it comes to pawpaw, is, is there a certain firmness to the fruit that you can detect or, or is it soft? Like, how would you 
compare that to like a mango, for example? Um, exactly. Yeah, the fruit gets soft, um, kind of like a ripe peach is what I would mm. compare it to. And it's harder to tell by appearance. Um, like I mentioned, most of them stay green, even when they're ripe. Sometimes they'll turn a slightly yellowish color, but um, mostly green when they're ripe. So one thing you'll notice is they will drop off the tree when they get ripe. So if you have a tree at home, you will see fruit on the ground under the tree when they get ripe. Or if you're hand harvesting, they will come off in your hand easily when they're ripe. You just touch the fruit or give it a really gentle wiggle and it'll fall right off into your hand when they're ripe. And they're also soft when you squeeze them, similar to a peach. So that's the best way to tell. They ripen, um, depends a little bit on where you are, but here in Kentucky, late August through late September is the season. Farther south um, would be could move a little earlier in August and farther north, it's more September to October is the season. Great, that's fantastic, wow. Well, one bigger question I have is, you know, as you've been involved in all these different elements of, of pawpaw optimization and, and value, you know, value added product ideation, um, where do you see the future of pawpaw? Like, do, does this fruit have a future in the larger scale of American cuisine? Well, there has been over the last 20 years or so, there's really been a lot of increased interest in pawpaw. I think interest in sustainability, um, you know, a plant that can be grown more sustainably, um, local foods, um, the slow food movement, local foods movement has really increased the interest in pawpaw. There are still the issues of the short shelf life and difficulty storing and shipping. So uh, the pawpaw industry has definitely grown. There are um, commercial growers of pawpaw. Um, but it's still predominantly a local market where you'll find them at local farmers markets. There are a few people that do mail order that ship, um, ship pawpaw fruit by mail order. And I think the value added products will probably be the bigger future of, of pawpaw commercially since those can be shipped more easily nationwide where pawpaws can't be grown. Yeah. But it's definitely been growing over the last 20 years or so. That's great. Well, I think it's really an exciting fruit. I think that it's a historic fruit. It's a, it's a heritage fruit, so to speak, and could play a really important part role, I think, in some of these um, urban food forests that I would love to see more of across the U.S., you know, these edible forests where people can go and, and um, experience what it's like to have native foods. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Being a native plant, it's, it's pretty low maintenance. Um, doesn't have, doesn't have a lot of insect or disease problems. Doesn't have to be sprayed and pruned and cared for quite as much as a lot of, um, you know, apples, peaches, grapes, things like that, that have a lot mm -hmm. more insect and disease problems. So it's something good, like you said, for community gardens or, um, you know, small scale sustainable agriculture or just for homeowners something that's a little bit lower, lower maintenance and better suited for our climate and conditions here. Yeah. So you're telling me it's low maintenance. It basically jumps off the tree into your hand when it's ready to be eaten. I think it's a win-win <laughs> and when it's great in ice cream. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, to all the three listeners out there, if you haven't tried a pawpaw, keep your eyes open this early fall, as she said, uh, ranging from maybe August into September, depending on which part of, um, I guess, how, how, how far north or south you live on the eastern side of the U.S. Um, to try these or check them out online. Um, as Sherry mentioned, there are many different products that are available today from ice creams to frozen pawpaw to beers and wines and brandies. That sounds really, um, really tasty, actually, some of those products too. <laughs> Definitely, and local restaurants, a lot of restaurants that um, have more local foods on the menu. Watch out for that in September, may have some pop desserts on the menu. That's great. And I wanted to also ask for all the students out there that are listening to this, um, you know, what advice do you have them if, for them if, if they're interested in pursuing this kind of work in horticulture with 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 interesting native plants like do you have any tips for them on on how to get started in that in that path sure well i think 
you know, it just being a hobby is a good start. That was why I majored in horticulture. I just, I liked gardening and we had fruit trees at home. So it was just kind of a hobby and an interest that I had. Um, so yeah, look for a university that has a good agriculture or horticulture program here at Kentucky State University. We have um, a degree in agriculture, food, and environment, but students specialize in what area they're interested in. And they also have a lot of research opportunities. That's something else that I would look out for. Um, students here can work with professors and develop their own research projects and do their research projects and be able to go and present that at conferences and get experience doing things like that. So um, a lot of really good, good opportunities for students here to to get their their feet wet doing research. That's fabulous. I like I like that idea. Like get get your feet wet, get some experience. If you love gardening already, imagine how much more you're going to love it once you really know a lot of this horticultural tools. Um, right. those things. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much, Shimmy, for coming on the show. It was great speaking with you. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded today on Restream. I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in every week to learn more and more about these connections between food, health, and the environment. And I also want to thank our producers to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment for putting on a great show every week. You can catch this and all of our other episodes at our website at Teach Ethnobotany. Um, on YouTube or on our website at the foodiepharmacology.com. Go ahead and click subscribe if you like the show. We're available on all of your major podcast streaming services. And please, please, please think about leaving us a rating online. We would love to get your feedback um, on this and all of our other episodes. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time. <laughs>